Zombies have been around for a long time. They vary from the fast, slow, and well dumb. No matter how they're presented, zombies are fascinating. The Last of Us is one example of the slew of zombie brains I have experienced recently. Now, I have a little history with the game. I watched YouTubers play the first game, and it spoiled most of the story for me. Then, I decided to watch The Last of Us TV show as it was premiering, and it did not disappoint. It was an excellent adaptation, and I thought better than the video game. However, I never played it before. I judged it harshly, so I sat down and went through 15 hours of struggle and depression. And I have to say, it was a journey. Now, sit down and relax, as I tell you my love and kinda hate relationship that is The Last of Us. seem bothered by all this. Not her, you know. What? Stop! Stop! Fucking touch me! Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie, and... it's me! It's me! It's me! Look, you're not my daughter. Oh, baby girl. <laughs> A young man named Neil Drunkman had an idea in 2004 when he was attending Carnegie Mellon University. He was tasked with creating and presenting a video game concept to the zombie film legend George A. Romero. It basically would merge the gameplay of Ico and a story setting like Night of the Living Dead with a lead protagonist in the style of John Harrington from Sin City. The story was about a police officer that was entrusted with protecting a young girl. However, due to the leading character's heart condition, players would often assume control of the girl. Unfortunately, Drunkman's idea didn't win Romero's eye, so Drunkman turned to the comic book scene and named the series The Turning. Then, that idea was turned down again, so Drunkman shelved it for a rainy day. Then, that rainy day came when he was working at Naughty Dog. After the significant success of Uncharted 2 Among Thieves in October 2009, the studio Naughty Dog decided to take a considerable risk and create a new IP. For the first time, the company decided to divide into two teams. One team would create Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception, and the other team to create The Last of Us. The two individuals running The Last of Us Project were Bruce Straley, the game director, and the man from earlier. Neil Drunkman as creative director. Another significant risk the company took for the game was creating new game engines to help solve their needs. The two major things they wanted to achieve were artificial intelligence and lighting. For artificial intelligence, they wanted characters in games like Ellie to remain close, but not feel like a burden. She's more organic in her actions, from commenting on the environment to exploring independently when not in danger. They wanted to make the player feel like these experiences were realistic, which they did. Now the enemy AI is even more intriguing, like the AI in Half-Life 2, or Fear. The enemies will study and find tactics to attack the player from surrounding them or just simple callouts that help immersion. Talking about the gameplay, did you know that Ellie was at first intended to be Joel's daughter? Though the development team felt this to be too limiting to character development. So much work went into creating this game from the art design. The team was inspired by Robert Podor's photographs of the Lower Ninth Ward following Hurricane Katrina, 
and how fungus interacted with environments. All these aspects combined helped design the opening credits to The Last of Us and the gameplay environment. Thoughtfully, so much dedication and hard work were added to this game, and there is just so much detail. I could talk for days and days about how the UI went through various iterations, or how they came to the idea of how they wanted to create the multiplayer mode. Three years of development, and it just blows me away. In 2011, Last of Us was officially announced. Though, Naughty Dog delayed the game, they still marketed it with video game trailers and press demonstrations. Finally, on June 14th, 2013, Sony Computer Entertainment published and caught the world on fire. Our story begins with a father and daughter. Sarah fixes a watch for her father, Joel. They chat as any family does, make humorous jokes, and banter. Sarah soon falls asleep and is woken by Joel's brother, Tommy. As the player, you control Sarah and move around the environment to look for Joel. Eventually, Sarah finds Joel, but everything starts going to hell because of an outbreak called Cordyceps a fungus that turns humans into aggressive and hostile animals called infected. Tommy finally comes to Joel and Sarah, and they try to leave the city. They get into a car crash, leading them through death and tense moments. They finally find some aid, but that is short-lived, as it turns out the military isn't fully there to help. The soldier shoots at Joel and Sarah. Joel finds out Sarah is shot and dies in his arms. 20 years later, the world has changed drastically. The infected has ravaged the population, and now survivors live in quarantine zones or independent settlements. Joel lives in one of these quarantine zones in Boston, Massachusetts. He works as a smuggler with his partner, Tess. They had a deal with a black market dealer named Robert, but Rob played them. So, Tess and Joel decided to recover the stolen weapon cachet and find Robert. They finally find Robert. God damn it. And before Tess places a lead object before his eyes, Robert reveals that he traded the cachet to the Fireflies. This rebel group opposes the quarantine zone authorities. Then, right after that, the leader of the Fireflies, Marlene, shows up and promises to double their cachet in return for smuggling a teenage girl, Ellie to a group of fireflies hiding in the Massachusetts State House outside the quarantine zone. Grudgingly, Joel and Tess agree and sneak out the next night with Ellie. The following night, the group sneaks out, but gets spotted and stopped by a patrol. The situation soon erupts into violence. <laughs> But after, it tells us one major thing. Ellie is infected, but immune. Symptoms commonly occur within two days, but Ellie claims she was infected three weeks earlier, and that her immunity may lead to a cure. The trio makes their way to their destination through hordes of the infected, but finds that the fireflies there have died. Tess reveals that she has been bitten by an infected, and, believing in Ellie's importance, sacrifices herself against pursuing soldiers so Joel and Ellie can escape. Joel decides to find Tommy, a former Firefly, and his brother, in the hope that he can locate the remaining Fireflies. So far, the story is intriguing and shows us who our characters are and what will push us through the story. Joel and Ellie's survival and relationship. I could be here all day recapping the story, but that isn't that exciting for most viewers, and for me. And you probably already know the story. I mean, crying out loud, they made it an enthralling show that was close to the source material. The story is about survival, 
but the other central motif it explores is fighting for something, albeit for love, revenge, or making up for lost time. For love, you see those ideas from Tommy and Joel's sibling relationship, and how Joel entrusts Tommy with taking Ellie under his wing. To Bill's lover, who's briefly touched on, and in the show, well, there's a whole episode, which I adored and cried a little in. Also, Sam and Henry, which I related to way more, because I have a younger brother myself. The most crucial aspect, though, is making up for lost time. See, throughout the game and the TV show, you play or see the world's perspective through Joel's eyes, ears, and fists. You start the game losing your daughter and feeling the pain. When Joel meets Ellie, he already has his guard up and distances himself. But as the game progresses, he starts growing attached to her. As Joel comes attached, the player does as well. We get entertained with the pun book. Ugh. Okay, you guys are killing me with your downer talk. It's joke book time. What is that? Just bear with me. You want to hear a joke about pizza? Never mind, it was too cheesy. I don't get it. Yeah, me neither. All right. I got a joke for you. Let's hear it. Why can't your nose be 12 inches long? I don't know, why? Because then it will be a foot. <laughs> that is so dumb. I love it. To Ellie trying to whistle, and finally achieving that goal. Are you alright? I'm trying to learn how to whistle. You don't know how to whistle. Well, does it sound like I know how to whistle? <laughs> I'm whistling. Oh, good. Something else you can drive me crazy with. We love her like her own kid, like Joel's kid. You start to learn that the game is not about survival, it's about revival. Joel's revival for love, and to finally care, and to be open to someone. Even if it's good, the plot always needs something more, and what sells it to me is the voice acting. Now there are tons of heavy hitters in this game, from Troy Baker, who plays Joel, I've been on quite the adventure, little brother. I reckon it's got something to do with that girl. <laughs> it's got everything to do with that little girl. Jeffrey Pierce as Tommy. What makes you think I'd do this for you? This isn't for me, Tommy. This is for your damn cause. My cause is my family now. You ain't talking about some walk in the park here. Jesus, boy. Have Maria get some of your born-again friends to do it. They got I... families, too. Tommy, I need this. Annie Worshing as Tess. That's funny. At least find out who they were. Yeah, look, they were a couple of nobodies. They don't matter. What matters is that Robert fucking sent them. Ellie, played by Ashley Johnson. What about me? You stay here. This is so stupid. We'd have more of a fucking chance if you let me help. I am. You seem to know your way around a gun. You reckon you can handle that? Well, I sort of shot a rifle before, but it was at rats. Rats? With BBs. Well, it's the same basic concept. Every dialogue line, while it may be small or insignificant, still sounds good and draws you as the player more into the world. You can see the motions from Marlene, played by Meryl Derringer. I pretty much lost everything. And then you show up, and somehow we find you just in time to save her. Maybe it was meant to be. To W. Earl Brown, playing Bill. I see so much as a threat. Ow! Stop! Son of a bitch! You done? Am I done? You come into my house, you set off all my traps, 
You damn near break my shooting arm. Who the fuck is this punk and what's she doing here? I am none of your goddamn business, and we're here because you owe Joel some favors. And oh. you can start by taking these off. I owe Joel some favors. Is some kind of joke? Everyone, and I mean everyone, knocks that out of the park. And it makes me love this game and how they portray people. In 2012, Naughty Dog revealed The Last of Us to thousands of individuals at a gaming expo called E3. The gameplay showed the lush rundown city and some dialogue between Ellie and Joel, and later in the demo, explored the combat mechanics. It starts with stealth and choking out individuals, then the shooting mechanics and how the character will react from being shot to shooting back in retaliation. My favorite part of the demo is the aggression in hand-to-hand -hand combat, from Ellie throwing a brick to disorient a foe, to how Joel beat the snot out of someone. It is visceral, and adrenaline filled with violence. And it is brutal. Now combat is my favorite part of the game. Recently, I have been playing a game called Sifu. In that experience, you play a character that flows like water, and their punches are precise and make you feel like Donnie Yen. Though when playing Last of Us, it's more like this. When you're playing Joel, it feels like the punches will be your last. Every force is created in desperation and survival. You'll always be fighting until you're safe. Objects that help to have the upper hand are bricks and bottles. You can throw these breakables to daze the opponent and get the upper hand. Also, I love how if you're fighting someone, depending on what they are near, say a wall or cabinet, the game will use said furniture to knock the hell out of someone. Say, you don't want to use a bottle or a fist. Then grab a pipe or a plank of wood and bonk your fellow adversary. If you collect resources in the environment, you can add nails to beef up that bat so it can last longer and hit harder. Now resource management is needed. You will look in every nook and cranny to find enough supplies for that med kit, or hopefully find some bullets for that beautiful revolver. Seriously, you will need and use everything at your disposal. Though the one thing you will gain quickly and lose even quicker is bullets. I cannot tell you how many shots I whiffed or stuck in someone's cranium. No matter if you're causing a stir with those guns, and if you're going to use them, you better be ready. Like Willem Dafoe once said, uh, There was a firefight! Foes will surround you and won't stop at anything to end your life. You'll be ducking and changing weapons as you take each foe down individually. To add to the gunplay is the exquisite sound design. Walking around environments with the ambient soundtrack playing makes you feel and believe you're in this world. It's haunting, but beautiful, and I would not ask for more. Lastly, to cap it all off, I want to talk about the best scene of the game, and how I wish the TV show gave it more justice. First, 
Watch. Easy. Please. Holy shit. Help. Are we gonna help him? Put your seatbelt on, Ellie. Well, what about the guy? Well, he ain't even hurt. Catch your breath. We're leaving. Okay. Watch out! Stay down! This entire sequence just twisted my gut. The Hank Williams song, Alone and Forsaken, plays as raiders ambush Joel and Ellie in the aftermath. It puts you into this tense and emotional moment from just trying not to die and protecting Ellie. Finally, the scene crescendos into unsettling silence. The whole moment is just the cherry on a Sunday. Now the show, while I still enjoyed it, pales in comparison. It kept the scene more grounded and left out my favorite part, the song Alone and Forsaken. The piece adds to people's desperation on both sides from survival with Joel and Ellie, to the raider's way of survival of taking. It puts people in an alone and forsaken situation. The show doesn't show enough emphasis on just the desperation, which is missing, I feel, in each episode, including this one. They focus more on the character building, and in a way the violence... It's just one of those most visceral moments in the game is Ellie taking down David in the lodge. Before the encounter, you're playing as Ellie, trying to escape captivity. You are traversing through a snowstorm in a town unfamiliar to her and the player. Finally, you enter the lodge, thinking you are safe. Then boom, David comes out of nowhere. It soon becomes a cat and mouse game and makes my stomach turn. Your stealth is all over the place, because you have to take any shot you can at David. Initially, he walks around usually, but he soon ups the ante by ultimate stealth, like you. He evens the playing field, and it's anxiety-inducing. Once you take that final strike, though, Ellie goes full-on rage, not only out of desperation, but to survive. It is gruesome, but understandable. It turns Ellie into who she is and will continue to become, a brutal but trauma survivor. Now, the TV show also does a f great damn job on this. It's just something about their characters and how they do dialogue and how David's character kind of points out that Ellie is evil in a way. It's, and so it prepares the sequel quite well. Comparatively to the game, where it doesn't do that in well, it just shows more of the trauma. So I love that too. See, I'm telling you, the show is just interesting, because there's some great parts and there's some... Eh. Another sequence, though, I do admire, is the last hour of the game. Now, we're not going to really be talking about the show anymore, but... See, Joel and Ellie finally make it to Salt Lake City. You make it through the city and get captured by a Firefly patrol. However, this was the goal all along. 
get Ellie to the Fireflies so they can find a cure. Marlene tells Joel that Ellie is getting ready for surgery, but is unaware that she will die. Joel, unwilling to let this happen, decides to fight back through the hospital. He finally finds her and takes her home, until he's confronted by Marlene again. She tries to stop him, but Joel shoots and kills her to prevent the Fireflies from pursuing them. Soon, Ellie wakes up, and Joel lies and tells her that the Fireflies have found many other immune people, but cannot create a cure and have stopped trying. Honestly, this is the most justified feeling and reaction. For one, how do we know that the cure will work? So we should risk taking another life on the off chance this may work? How do we know if there are no other options? The list goes on and on. And if it were someone I loved well, I would take everyone down to save the one person in my life that matters. Though, I'll leave you with one thought before this video, Chris Sendos. Should Joel have lied to her? The ending at the end of the day leaves us hollow and lost because we know that Ellie knows the truth. It's the most poignant thing in the world, which overall is why I love the last of us. Thank you.